Hi everyone, Michael Britt here. Now, I'm very proud that the Psych Files podcast has been so successful. It passed the 20 million download mark. And a lot of that success is due to my episodes on how you can use proven memory strategies to remember just about anything, from memorizing terms for a test to remembering people's names at a party or a meeting, or even memorizing speeches. It's amazing how useful these strategies are. So, I put all of these episodes into one audio course. The course is called Hippos, Aliens, and Llamas Quickly Master the Tricks to a Great Memory. And it's available now on avid.fm slash memorymaster. All one word. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Psych Files. Michael Britt here. And today I have an interview with the authors of a really interesting book. It's called How the Brain Lost Its Mind, a really interesting book about the interconnection between, would you believe, syphilis and psychology. And the authors have some really interesting stories about some famous names in history, such as Anton Mesmer and uh, Charcot, a tiny bit of Freud in there, but the... Um, this is a really interesting story that they have to tell, and I think you're going to enjoy this interview. So, um, well, let me just jump right in. So I'm here with the authors, Alan Roper, MD, and Brian David Burrell. Alan is the professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, executive vice chair of the Department of Neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and deputy editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, so uh, quite a background. Uh, principal author also of the uh, widely consulted textbook of neurology called The Principles of Neurology in its 11th edition. I bet that was a lot of work. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I can only imagine. I've written one book, wasn't a textbook, and that was a lot of work. So um, 11 editions of a textbook. Wow. I only did the last six, but that, it's, it's still <laughs> but labor of love. I'll, I'll bet. Also with us, Brian David Burrell, Senior Lecturer of Mathematics and Statistics in the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he is a teacher, writer, and author of several books. You guys are great at titles. The other book from you two is Reaching Down the Rabbit Hole, which sounds like something i got to take a look into and see what you're up to. There's some Alice in Wonderland connections there, I'm guessing? Well, yeah, about uh, the insanity of the, and how insane the mind could be. So this is cool. You know, I taught the history of psychology for many years when I was a full-time professor, and um, it's not the most exciting topic, as you can imagine, not one that really grabbed the students' interest until we got into things like we're going to talk about today, which is, of course, Mesmer and Charcot. They were all interested in that. But you've written a very different kind of book because it's, um, it's not like uh, the typical textbook where you would wrap up a topic in Chapter 1 and then you begin a new topic in Chapter 2. Uh, the segues between chapters really make it uh, pretty interesting. It's like you uh, you want to peek at the next chapter before you, you end uh, the one you're just reading. But before I get it, I'd like to ask you if you'd like to add anything to your backgrounds that you think our listeners ought to know about. I will say I was among the last people, last persons uh, and generation to actually get very close to syphilis of the brain because I saw those patients while I was training. That's what triggered a lot of the ideas in this book. The books, is it the subtitle or is it just... Is it, uh, it well, the, the original subtitle was Sex, Syphilis, and Psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. which was alliterative, alliterative for sure, but uh, you know, may, may not have captured uh, everything we wanted. So we landed with this. But it's a book about syphilis and syphilis of the brain and how it altered our ideas of the mind and mental illness today. Interesting. Yeah, that's an angle... I don't remember seeing in any of my history of psychology textbooks. You know, syphilis was rampant in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century, and it filled asylums. What struck me about it was it could imitate any form of what we now call mental illness, psychosis, depression, criminality, sociopathy, delusional states. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, that meant uh, it deserved a, a, a closer look. And now that it's having a resurgence, that is, syphilis is. Really? Oh, yeah. Huh. We thought it was timely. Ought to have a look at uh, how we're thinking about the relationship between the mind and the brain and how those ideas today are based on what happened 200 years ago 
-hmm. And that finally, we're probably not much closer to a real understanding of the mind than we were then. Okay, uh, Brian, just a little bit about yourself as well before I jump into my first big question. Well, I, I assume that you might be interested in how someone who teaches mathematics. <laughs> well, I did well, see that. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> brains and neurology and psychiatry. Mm -hmm. uh, that goes back 20 years uh, to an article that appeared in the British medical journal, The Lancet. It was called The Exceptional Brain of Albert Einstein. Oh, yeah. The basic message of the article was that Einstein had a brain uniquely suited for math mm. and the corollary to that, I suppose, to my students would have been that they didn't have brains uniquely uh, suited for math. And I was rather disappointed in that, so I, I began to look into it and found out that there were brain collections around the world, so-called elite brain collections, to study this very idea. Are certain brains suited to do certain things? Basically, I traveled around and tracked down these collections, and I went into the background to see whether there was anything to it. Did Einstein really have a brain uniquely suited to do math? There's absolutely no proof to that whatsoever. It's just um, a lot of suggestions, possibilities, nothing has ever panned out. That's actually led to our getting together to write these, these two books. You know, I wrote a book about the brains called Postcards from the Brain Museum. Mm -hmm. It traced that whole history. And that came to Alan's attention. And uh, um, he invited me out to Brigham and Women's as a result of that. And from that, we began to collaborate on uh, books about neurology. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, I taught statistics, too. <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah. For social psychology. I mean, for social science majors. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, I had all the fun courses. So, uh, but now wasn't Einstein, isn't there like a whole story behind Einstein's brain and what happened to it? I know it was taken out. Oh, yes. Yes. It was taken out uh, upon his death and it was kept by the doctor who removed it. Um, he actually wasn't supposed to be there at the time. It was supposed to be removed by someone else, but that doctor wasn't on duty. It was removed at Princeton Hospital, and this man, Thomas Harvey, kept the brain. And uh, he kept it for about, I believe, about 40 years. He traveled uh -huh. around with it and tried to get people interested in studying it. Uh -huh. And, yeah, it was the basis of a book called Driving Mr. Albert. <laughs> uh, and it's a, it's it's... On the one hand, yes, it's an amusing concept, but it's really kind of sad when you think about yeah, it, yeah. that his brain and his eyeballs were oh, removed dear. and preserved. Oh. His eyeballs apparently are still in a safe deposit box somewhere, perhaps in New York City, uh, and his brain is in pieces. It was eventually returned to the hospital, I think within the last decade. Mm -hmm. Nothing was ever found of any use. Nothing unique. But yes, there are there are many stories like that, not just yeah. about Einstein's brain, but th that's that's what I investigated and, and uncovered. In which book was that? Postcards from the Brain Museum. Okay, I'll put a link to that on my site. Okay, so all of my students have heard of Franz Mesmer probably because you know the the hypnotists come to colleges and put on shows, so um, they've heard of him. We go into it a little bit, but but I didn't talk to them about Maria Theresa von Paradis. So let's just jump in that because it's a fascinating story. Who wants to talk about that first? Well, I'll I'll take a shot at it. So uh, Mesmer was a physician uh, living in Vienna, and in the 1770s he came upon this idea that the, the universe was infused with a magnetic force that could be harnessed, mm -hmm. and it could be harnessed to cure people of various ailments. He, he referred to it as animal magnetism. And um, so it's, it's worth pointing out that he wasn't a charlatan. He oh. uh, believed that this was a legitimate scientific investigation, and his initial attempt a study involved a, a, a woman who had what we would today call a functional disorder or in that era, hysterical symptoms. And what he did is he gave her a tonic containing iron and he applied magnets to various parts of her body and she began to feel a lot better. And from this, he developed a kind of cure, a kind of treatment. 
His most famous patient, though, is this Maria Theresia von Paradis. Uh, she was a young girl who at age four apparently went blind, or at least declared she was blind. And her parents, who were pretty well connected, took her to doctors all over Vienna. And they couldn't do anything for her, but it seemed like her eyes were in perfect health. So they couldn't explain this. Mesmer volunteered in his services. And out of some desperation, the parents eventually took Maria to Mesmer's home, which was also his clinic. And he began to treat her with this animal magnetism techniques. So we're talking about a form of psychotherapy that he was actually employing, but again, backed by this idea of animal magnetism. And he began to have some success with her. By the way, at this point, she was a teenager, but she was also somewhat of a prodigy. She played the piano. Uh, Mozart uh, allegedly composed um, a sonata for her. Interesting. And so she was quite a celebrity in Vienna at the time, very well known. But she went to Mesmer's clinic, and he began to initially to have some success in getting her to see the broad outlines of objects. And that but, was by and, using this technique of having her drink, uh, drink something with iron in it? Right? I think by that point, he was not employing that particular technique. I, I think this was more of just a kind of a laying on of hands. He believed that he was a medium mm -hmm. through which animal magnetism would flow. Mm -hmm. And he seemed to have a lot of success with his patients in Vienna uh, with this very idea of a kind of a system that he had and the authority also that he had. I mean, we are talking really about a placebo effect. Right. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, this is the power of suggestion. So that's what he was using. He was gradually convincing her that she could see. And um, but it eventually ended in scandal. Mesmer had a lot of enemies in the professional community. And the other problem was eventually that little Maria figured out, as did her parents, that if she could see she would no longer be this, this wonderful blind child who could play the piano. Uh, in other words, she would lose what was so special about her. And so she began to regress. Her symptoms came back. The blindness came back. And she had to be removed from Mesmer's clinic. And uh, amid a scandal, a lot of rumors were conjured up by his enemies. And he, he was forced to leave Vienna because of it. You know, it's a very interesting story. You know, that story is like the beginnings of um, psychoanalysis, for that matter. I mean, Freud just revived mesmerism without the animal magnetism, but basically uh, the curing people with the power of suggestion. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So do we know if Maria – do we know anything about what – was she actually blind? No, no. She, she was not blind. I mean – she would navigate around her house and not bump into things, so we know she was uh, oh. not blind. And she declared that uh, the first thing she, quote, saw, unquote, when, when uh, she was treated was Mesmer's ugly face. <laughs> so she could, she could see. <laughs> this was a typical case of hysterical blindness. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, I know we've heard that, that term uh, many a time before. It's interesting, and I'm sure you'll mention at some point this whole concept of hysteria and hysterical is um, not seen in a positive way anymore. And it's sort of seen as something like because men don't want to access their emotions and women are more open to that, men refer to them as being hysterical, as if they have a problem when they express their feelings. Well, that's certainly part of it. Uh, I mean the history, hysteria part, the root of it was that it was thought that a lot of peculiar swooning, seizures, fainting in women, mm -hmm. and odd behaviors were the result of a wandering uterus. A wandering womb, right. Yeah. So um, it, we, it's been destigmatized. Uh, it's now called functional illness because hysterical had this connotation of not just uh, that it was in your head and there was something wrong with your, with your head, but that it was a female, which is not true. There's a fair amount of male functional illness. Uh, and B, that, um, you know, hysterical means going wild, waving arms, putting on mm -hmm. uh, shows and so on. And neither is quite true. 
Interesting. So, so you know, this is this is one of the one of the things I really liked about the book. I mentioned earlier the transitions between chapters. So you end this chapter, uh, Maria, uh, chapter three, with this sentence: uh, Mesmer's failure to bring back Maria Theresa's sight led to his disgrace and banishment, as you mentioned. Charcot should have known he was tempting the same fate when he decided to hypnotize Blanche Whitman. And that's the end of the chapter, and you're going, oh, good. <laughs> Who's Blanche Whitman? What happened next? Well, uh, Blanche was uh, a young woman who came from a very poor background in Paris and was sort of sent uh, as a helper to a furrier who was probably almost certainly sexually abusive to her uh, as a young adolescent and teenager, and she repeatedly ran away. Uh, she ultimately found her way to Charcot's hospital, Sarpetriere, where a lot of wayward women in particular were housed with people who had uh, genuine epilepsy and sort of the original sin of psychiatry and neurology occurred in Charcot's demonstration. He's still considered the most famous and prominent neurologist of all time, basically founded the field in many ways and had tremendous successes in finding what the pathology was for Parkinson's, for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease, for multiple sclerosis, an amazing uh, intellect. But he thought that the hysteria and hysterical trances and positions that were assumed and, and epileptic seizures that were assumed by many of the women uh, in his institution uh, were the result of brain disease similar to epilepsy. And he got uh, sort of misguided, derailed from the beginning. Blanche was his star pupil. She would put on demonstrations, large public demonstrations, always sexualized but with a lot of leering men in the background as portrayed in the famous painting that's in the um, inside cover of the book. So Blanche was quite a character actor, and she to her dying day claimed that she faked nothing, that it would be impossible to fool uh, the great Charcot. Uh, the whole business, her, her craziness, her hysteria, and everybody else's went away when Charcot died, which speaks for itself. Yeah, as in, I think I remember uh, in the book that she – Charcot would act uh, – he would talk to these men uh, in his uh, small audience – as if she wasn't there saying things about what she would do, and sure enough, she did those things. Yeah, and a lot of it, this is the power of suggestibility and the, the sort of um, duality of the, uh, of the powerful man and the, the weaker and subjugated woman. I mean, it's, it's a story that's repeated over and over, but it, it's pretty incredible. And she was sort of uh, the, the uh, case alpha for hysteria of the time. But that was balanced by the neurosyphilis that was also rampant. And those, the convergence of those two is the central fulcrum of the book, that these two opposites were, uh, in a way, dominated thinking about the mind and the brain, and still do today, their vestiges do. Hmm. So you mentioned that um, Charcot tried a technique called ovarian compression. It was very popular at the time, didn't originate with her. It was an extension of this idea that um, this, these peculiar seizures in particular, convulsions, were a result of a female problem and a displacement of the ovaries. So someone had devised a belt with these two large buckles that were placed over where the ovaries were thought to occur, and it was tightened up, and it stopped the seizures which, you know, uh, demonstrates sort of that they were what we would call functional today. Uh, kind of primitive, but, you know, not a lot was known about the way the brain worked at that time. And still was an open question, what was happening in these people? Was much known about, you know, female productive anatomy? A lot was known about the anatomy, mm -hmm. but the bizarre connections between uh, organs of reproduction and mental states was fabricated by men uh, <laughs> with no really, uh, you know, no basis at all, except that the idea in a way went back several hundred years previously and they latched onto it. Fascinating. And, and what year are we talking about right now? These are the late 1800s. Correct. Those late 1800s. Yeah. He, he made hysteria a popular disease. There was a, a spike in hysteria then the way there's a spike in syphilis now. 
Fascinating. I didn't know. What do you think is causing the spike in syphilis? Well, uh, it's real, and a good part of it is related to HIV and people living with HIV, but not all of it. And in the United States, that accounts for perhaps half of the spike. Uh, the other half is just venereal, sexual transmitted infection. Yeah, but around the world, it's also reemerging. It has in part to do with the fact that it's still stigmatized, number one, and in part to do with the fact that it's been forgotten so that people don't recognize it uh, when it occurs. And uh, there are probably a lot of people who have it that we don't know about. That's a bigger worry because they're able to transmit it unknowingly. It's treatable, but the treatment is a little bit arduous. As I said, I was one of the last people to have to check these people by doing repeated spinal taps to see if the treatment was successful. So I had a very proximate uh, uh, look at it. Yeah. I think it's worth adding that another big factor here is the lack of testing. For example, here at UMass, probably around the country, every student who comes to college has to have a tuberculosis test. And if you go back a half century, everyone in most states of the country, everyone applying for marriage license had to have a syphilis test. Mm -hmm. This was quite common. In fact, um, people being admitted to the hospital routinely were given a syphilis test. But that doesn't occur anymore. There are, I don't think there are any states left with mandatory blood tests or a marriage license. That's correct. And so... I mean, that was a, a huge factor in the reduction of rates of syphilis transmission, you know, starting in the 1950s. And up through the 70s, it seemed like a disease that could be wiped out, at least in the United States. But it has come back, uh, partly because of this lack of testing and treatment. Uh, I think, uh, in fact, just uh, the day before yesterday, you know, Ra Rachel Maddow was bringing up on her show that the defunding of Planned Parenthood and reduced availability of testing for these sorts of things is going to and probably is already reducing a spike in gonorrhea and syphilis transmissions around the country. You see this in the news all the time these days. Well, so, it's so prominent that uh, Oregon has a website called Syphilware. And if you pull it up, it says, Oregon is known for many things. Natural beauty. One last thing. Coffee, Remember to beer, check out my Pinot memory Noir. course. You Did you know that Oregon is also known for syphilis? Tests, to remember oh, people's names syph and even help you to remember those jokes you keep forgetting. Aware so is you their, will be the amazed. Department of Health Avid website. Dot FM it's reemerging memory uh, with master a vengeance. Avid and AVID um, eventually it's likely that slash some infected master. people will show up in neurology clinics, as we allude to in the book with dementia and will be said to have um, Alzheimer's disease or something, or will be psychotic. But they actually have syphilis. So, so that's part of the key of your book is that the symptoms of syphilis look like emotional disorders. It's well, oh yeah, it looks mm -hmm. like a variety of what we now call mental illness, mm -hmm. which is sort of where the book heads. What is mental illness? Is there such a thing as mental illness? If there's nothing in the brain, Here's a disease, syphilis, where there's something bad in the brain. And it set us off on the idea we're still wedded to that eventually the cause of every form of aberrant behavior will be found in some unusual brain abnormality. That goes back to Brian's involvement with Einstein's brain and famous brains. And not only that, but criminal brains were studied, said mm -hmm. it's just an extension of phrenology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's reductionist and I think it's oversimplified. So you say in the book that, um, what, how do you pronounce his name, Daudet? Daudet. 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 Um, yeah. You believe he had, what was his first name? Gosh, I don't have it in front of me. Alphonse. Alphonse. French guy. That he, you believe he had syphilis, even though it looked, uh, again, like he had some kind of psychological disorder. And Charcot was, was reluctant to even think about diagnosing him with syphilis? Daudet's problem was a little bit different. He was not suffering from any mental illness or uh, dementia or mania. He had a problem called locomotor ataxia, which is this ataxic gait, the inability basically to sense where your feet are. And so you have this very stumbling form of walking. 
and you also have lightning pain shooting up your spine on a, sort of a random basis. Uh, he was very disabled. Uh, it was known that he was syphilitic, but the question was, did the syphilis have anything to do with his neurological problem? So Charcot correctly diagnosed him as having this so-called locomotor ataxia, but he was not willing at that time to attribute it to syphilis. So th this, it, it's a very interesting point in history. I mean, looking back on it, it's very easy to criticize because we know a lot of things now that we mm -hmm. certainly were not known back then. You have these two things. You have hysteria. A, a lot of um, men, particularly, who came in to see neurologists would have a complaint of these symptoms that were quite often written off as being hysterical. Or actually, the term they would use on men would be neurasthenic. Neuro. And, <laughs> neurasthenia. Neurasthenia, yes. Yeah. I mean, something was, was wrong with their nerves. The, so yeah. for men, it was something wrong with your nerves, and for women, it was something wrong with your mind. Correct. <laughs> well, pretty much. I mean, it was considered, yes, a disease of the nerves, a nervous disease. Mm -hmm. And that's what neurologists dealt with. And frequently, it turned out to be hysterical. So the, the irony in the book is that you, that time in Charcot's era, you have these things, these behaviors, these symptoms, which they were trying to explain. And syphilis was in the mix as a possible culprit, but it, it just couldn't be proven. So Charcot was basically doing the best that he could in those circumstances. But basically, a lot of patients like Dade that he saw were indeed suffering symptoms of advanced syphilis, syphilis that invaded the spinal column. And then there were other people who he thought had real neurological disease, like Blanche Whitman, who it turned out did not have a disease at all. Her problem was psychological. Okay, so I'll tell you what, let me, I'm just about to bring the interview with a close. You mentioned, I think, Alan, this famous painting, it's called, well, there are actually two that you mentioned in the book. This one of, of Charcot at work, that is right a couple pages into the, into the book. It's a, you really uh, get right into this picture and tell us who's, who's where, who's who, and what's happening. A anything else you want to tell us about this fascinating drawing? Right? We, put, we put the picture in the front uh, pages of the book. Well, there's Charcot right on his famous swooning patient, Blanche Whitman, mm -hmm. half undressed, falling into the arms of his, his major assistant, and all these uh, men viewing the show and him turning it into a medical problem. Mm -hmm. And that medicalization of everything we're still living with, that there will be an explanation in the brain. That was Charcot's fundamental idea. He's an amazing uh person, ama amazing neurologist and doctor, but he's uh, derided because of this one error, uh, unfortunately. But there it is. And we're still, we're still living with his uh, error. Yeah, it's a very cool photo. A anyone who, uh, image, uh, apparently it's, you've got it. It's called <laughs> Une Laisson Clinique à la Salpêtrière. Yeah. Every Tuesday, Charcot put on a clinic that was open to physicians but a lot of people from the public came, including famous writers and artists and, you know, denizens of, uh, of nightclubs and so on. And then it just took off from there as a sideshow. And Sigmund Freud. Oh. Freud, correct. Freud could have been standing in the back of that painting. Uh, he came just a bit later. But it was that experience that um, twigged him to the idea that the mind was powerful and that you could use the mind to cure itself fascinating well that's so cool uh, uh, this is really an interesting read i did not know what a what a, a powerful uh, say component uh, syphilis had in, in the history of psychology and, and you make really a int very interesting case for it here so um so so let me thank you both for for taking the time out to talk with me uh, and uh, i'll have links to the book how the Brain Lost Its Mind. Really, really interesting. Uh, a lot of work, I'm sure. So um, you're going to educate a lot of, of students and, and just lifelong learners uh, in the history of uh, psychology here. We hope anybody who's interested in the brain and behavior will take a look at it. All right. Thanks so much. All Thank right. Thanks, gentlemen. All Thank right. you. Take care. One last thing. Remember to check out my memory course. You can use these strategies to get better grades on your tests 
to remember people's names, and even help you to remember those jokes you keep forgetting. So you will be amazed. Avid.fm slash Memory Master. That's Avid, A-V-I-D dot F-M slash Memory Master. Thanks.